Welcome, welcome back to Monday, CS110. We are continuing with multi-processing, which is, uh, like I said, the first time you're probably seeing things happening in parallel of a program you've written. So we're gonna uh, take the time we need to discuss that. We're also gonna talk about, uh, today we're gonna talk about these things called pipes, which are, um, basically a way for two processes to send data back and forth using read and write. So we'll get to that. And then we'll talk a little bit more, depending on how much time we have, uh, about inter-process communication, which basically means uh, that we'll talk about uh, how two processes actually talk to each other and how you end up getting a message a signal, if, as, uh, which is another name for it, uh, how you get a signal when a child actually finishes. So we'll get to that um, uh, by the end of the class, I think. How's the assignment going? File system going all right? I've seen a couple, couple thumbs up. It, it's definitely, you know, it's got a lot of little moving parts to it. Um, somebody was just asking me in the hallway about, uh, about, like, how do you know when you're reading data what kind of data it holds? You kind of don't unless you're in a function where you're specifically reading data from the disk where you already have information about, oh, I'm reading a file, uh, or I'm reading a directory, or I'm reading an inode uh, block, or something like that. You have to know that as you, when you call these functions that read from the disk, because the disk itself could care less what's on it. It just matters uh, to you as the actual operating system, and the file system has been put in place with certain uh, certain things associated with each block. So that's how you know that. Anyway, hope it goes well. Uh, any questions on the assignment at this point? Piazza's been uh, going along. Do you have any comments or questions about it? Uh, yeah. Good question. So the question was, hey, you said that you're able to, you are allowed to change some of the functions. You mean the ones we've already written for you? Things like that? No. Uh, you should not change the return values for functions if you can help it. I mean, the, the, especially the one, I mean, in general, leave them the same. If you need to for some reason, you should have a really good reason for it. Um, but no, you should, the, the spec we've laid out shouldn't need to be changed in, as far as the return values. Um, if you have a specific question, come on up, up after and let me know what you're talking about and we'll, we'll chat about whether or not. But most of the time, no. Yeah. Everybody else? Okay, office hours are this evening and for the rest of the week. I have my office hours tomorrow morning. Uh, there haven't been that many people showing up, so I may just add some office hours, um, kind of maybe in the afternoons. Uh, I'm thinking maybe Wednesday after class. Would more people be able to go to that? If I had, I don't see two, I see a couple people. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll see about doing that in my own schedule. I gotta look at it. Um, but we'll try to uh, put some more office hours in there. Or Thursday around the same time uh, might also work. So we'll do that. All right, so last week we actually finished with the example I'm gonna go back over again. Remember, we've been talking about this interesting uh, system call called EXECVP, which is part of the EXEC or exec functions uh, system calls. And what that does is it says, I want to run another program and basically replace my current process with that program. Now, if you want to do that, most of the time you're not going to be done with your program. I mean, you, there might be some cases where that's, that's going to be true. But most of the time, you want your program to kind of spawn off this other process that's some other program, and you use fork to do that. So you fork, you get a child process, and you say to the child process, you will run this program, and in, while doing that, the child process will become that program, and that's it. Now, there is some communications between uh, the, that child program and the one you're, uh, the parent, and we gotta talk about how that actually happens. But so, so we wrote a little, just a very basic uh, program called My System. We're gonna expand on this a little bit more in a few minutes, and then we're going to expand, you're going to expand on it for assignment four, actually. You're gonna make a much more robust um, my system kind of command, which is basically a little shell is what we're talking about. Okay, so here's what the uh, program 
itself did. Okay, so let's look through this a little bit. It basically, uh, the first thing the my system function, this is the my system function does, okay, it takes in a command. And that could be something like ls or cat file.txt. It just takes a command in and it's going to run that command using the shell itself, the actual shell. We do that so that it's a little easier to parse it. When you get to yours um, for assignment four, you will figure out how to do it without you, like using the shell as kind of training wheels. You'll see, we'll see what that means uh, in a little bit. Um, and then uh, it takes that command and then it does this fork Okay, does this fork and my pen has died. Hang on one second. Hopefully it's in here. Maybe. There it is. So, the, uh, so it actually forks because we are about to call exec CVP. So we don't want to get make it the only, uh, we don't want the, the function to be done for our program. Okay. Oh no, it's done. Didn't work at all. Hang on. Uh, okay. Hang on. Maybe we won't use these again. Hang on. Let's see. Nope. That's not working. I'll try this one more time and then we will not use this going forward. Nope. Not working. Tablet. Dead. All right. So anyway, what it's doing is, um, I'll even blow this up here. So basically, the it's going to fork. And then if it's the child, it's going to spawn this other process, which is the program you want to run. OK? And it's going to do that by basically saying, OK, actually run this program called slash bin slash sh, which is the shell program. Run it with the dash c option which says, hey, run the following program. So it's kind of like two levels of indirection here. And then it's going to take your command and it's going to run that command that you have typed in. Okay? And then this is an array that has to be null terminated. So that's what's happening here. It's basically creating an arguments uh, array that is an array of string pointers, char star pointers. Okay? And then you call exec CVP and it calls the, uh, it's the first argument to exec CVP is the name of the program that is directly being run. In this case, it's slash bin slash sh, which also happens to be the first argument in the argument list, just like it is in main. And then the second one is the entire arguments list, second parameter. If that fails, then it returns to this function. If it doesn't fail, the entire rest of that child process is destroyed. It's cannibalized so that this other program can run. Remember, your parent is still running, but the child process you just created is now destroyed by running the other program. Okay? So that's what's going on there. Now, I actually am trying something new. One of our TAs actually uh, created this little uh, system here so you can actually in the slides run this, although I think the font is possibly a little too small, um, but you can actually run this in here. And here's what it looks like when it runs. There we go. And it puts up a little uh, cursor here like that. I'll just do make this a little bit. It puts a little cursor like that and you can type ls. And that's what the program is doing, right? It's actually uh, running ls and doing that. And then let's see, cat code.c should also print out the code. And so we've written kind of a little shell and it always comes back to the prompt for us at the end. Okay? The standard in for the uh, child process is just regular old standard in. We'll see how that might change in a little bit. Okay? And then to end this, by the way, for, just to end this uh, function, we actually do control D, which says uh, we're done entering things from standard in. It basically closes standard in for the process that's, uh, that's being run. Okay, so let's look at the main and how main actually works here. Main basically says, oh, okay, um, we're going to uh, do a while loop because we have to keep putting the little prompt, which is just this, this little arrow here. And it gets a line using f get s from, the, uh, from standard in. And that's what you type, ls or cat, whatever. And then if, we, if you type control D, it would end. That's what's going on there. And then it just uh, populates the new line, changes the new line into a zero so that we've actually got a, uh, just a regular old string here without the, uh, without the new line in it. And then it, 
it actually calls my system with the command, gets the return value back from my system, which is the return value from whatever uh, uh, the my system command does, and then it uh, continues the loop. Okay, do you see what's going on there? All right, so that's what we kind of covered the other day. Uh, let's move on, and uh, this is the test harness, I just showed you that. Uh, let's move on and we'll talk about a little bit more detail of the similar type of program in a few minutes. I want to introduce a couple of other topics, okay? We're going to introduce uh, the, the notion of a pipe, which I mentioned earlier, and then dupe two. Now in lab, you should have covered dupe to some extent. We'll go over the details of what, that's, what uh, dupe two in particular is doing uh, here, okay? So now let's have a little more complicated uh, shell. All right, um, in the actual, let's see, I just want to make sure that we're getting to the, because there's no piping yet. Let's actually go ahead and do this, uh, the more uh, advanced shell here. Okay, this is going to be simple shell dot C and, oh no, hang on, it is, yeah, it is simple shell. Uh, comp, hang on, I think I already had it in simple shell. Started it? Nope, oh, nope. Oh. All right, we'll just look at it. I won't type it all right now. I've got plenty of things to type a little bit later. Here's what we're going to uh, look at. Actually, I can do it in the thing over here now that I think about it. Um, here's what the code is going to do uh, in this case. Okay, we are going to create a shell that actually allows you to do a background command. Now, what is a background command? In the regular old uh, shell, Okay, you can do the following. You can actually type a command that runs in the background, which means that you get your prompt back immediately and now it's all, the other program is still running. Why might you want to do that? Well, there might be various reasons why uh, to, th that you might want to have some other program running and you still want to use your shell. Okay, it's a little weird if you do something like ls-al, but then you put it in the background. And that's how you put it in the background, by the way. You put a, an ampersand. And what it does is it actually immediately says, let me go back up here, here we go. It immediately says, hey, this is a process I just created. And then it gives you a prompt back and the rest of it continues going, right? I think I showed you an example of this uh, the other day um, that actually, uh, that actually kind of it was, what was it? It was like while one, actually I wouldn't think it was quite this one, but while one, uh, echo, are you annoyed yet? Something like that, semicolon, sleep, one, done. Oops, uh, let's see, while one, do, do echo, there we go, okay. So that's that, right? We can just run this, and it's just gonna run every second. If I put that in the background, right? What it will do is it will, every second, just tell me that, right? Which I can do other things, and every second it just says, you know, you and then whatever, right? And I'm still able to run programs, and this is kind of the same sort of thing I showed you the other day, right? And it just basically does, it's running in the background. So I've now done that by doing the ampersand on the end of the program that says, hey, run this program and then let me do other stuff. And you might think of various reasons why you want to do that. And this would be a bad thing to do unless you want to be annoyed lots. Okay? And then actually you have to actually type FG and then control C and it will actually stop the program. FG says put it in the foreground. Okay? You can actually do this a, a different way too. If I just run that same command without the ampersand and let it go, if I want to put this one in the background, I just type control Z, not control C, control Z, and it will put it in the background and stop it, which might be what I want, okay? Um, and then if we want to actually continue it, let's see, uh, let's see, if we want to continue it, I think, let's see, I think if we, nope, hang on, uh, job, nope, PS, oh, I might have killed it accidentally, hang on, might have killed it. Let's see, if I do control Z, it stops it. And then uh, I can put it back in foreground. No, I think it didn't, I think it only stops the, the, the final thing that I did. My while loop isn't gonna necessarily work. I could do it this way though. I could say like um, annoying.shell, uh, let's see, hang on. 
we're going to check this. There we go. And then vim annoying.shell. All right, there we go. Now, annoying.shell, annoying. OK, there we go. Now that's that. And then hopefully this will keep, it'll, if I keep doing, there we go. It'll keep, there we go. Now it's, now it's in the background. So what you basically do is you run a program, and then if you do control Z, it stops it, pauses it in the background, and then if you type BG, it will continue it running in the background. Okay? And then that's, uh, that's it. And now I can still type LS, but every second it's going to say, are you annoyed yet, et cetera. And then if I want it to go in the foreground, I can do, I can type FG, it will go in the foreground, and then I can hit control C and get rid of the message finally. All right. So what we are going to look at here is this program that basically uh, will use the idea of a background to enable us to run background processes. So it's a little bit more advanced than what we had before. Okay, so let's look at the actual uh, code here. Okay, another while loop because we want our uh, little shell to actually keep going and giving us back a prompt. Okay. Uh, we're going to read a command, which is another function, which basically reads the command in from the uh, line there. Okay. We are going to uh, create an arguments uh, list, which is going to uh, have the command in it. That's going to parse the command. If you want to look at all the details of these functions, you can, you can see them. But basically, we're going to type in a command, have it parsed, and that part is not really that important to what we're trying to do here. Okay, uh, and then we are going to look for something called a built-in, which is this quit thing. You know how before we had to type control D and it would end? Now we just type quit and it actually ends. So this is actually just a little kind of a, uh, an extra part here where we say, oh look, if the arguments that we typed in was quit, then stop this while loop. That's nice. Okay, and then if the last thing in the argument was the ampersand, we want to put this in the background. In other words, we want to go back to our prompt and let it keep running. Okay, well, how are we going to do that? We'll see. Okay, we are basically going to uh, do the following. We're going to see if we are in the background, okay, then uh, we're going to get rid of the little ampersand so we can run the command correctly. Then we're going to fork. Okay. And if we are the child, remember if the return value from fork is zero, we are the child, we are going to call exec CVP on the arguments with the argument zero and the arguments. And that, of course, is going to not return because it's the child. We should do error checking on this. Like if I type a command that doesn't work, it shouldn't, shouldn't do this. If it's the background, we're just going to print the actual child process PID and then the command we did and then we're going to continue going back to another prompt. Okay? And then we are going, if not, if it's not in the background, we have to do a wait PID. And the wait PID does what? It tells the parent, don't do anything until the child process ends. Okay? So that's the, that's the uh, one here. And again, you can go look up some of the details uh, there. I think I actually have another, yeah, I can run it here as well. Okay. Run it here. All right, this is simple. The prompt happens to be called simple sh. Okay, you will be writing one called uh, stsh for Stanford Shell. Okay, if I type ls, there we go. If I type, uh, let's see, if I type l, oh, you know what? I'm going to run this in the other one so I can show you the one that we just did. Um, simple, oh, maybe not, make simple shell. There we go, simple shell. Okay, so if I type ls, then it will give me that. I can type uh, cat my system dot c, and it will give me that. If I type the cat my system dot c with the ampersand on it, then it actually runs in the background, and my prompt is going to be up here somewhere. Right, it's going to be way up here. There, it actually printed out the process number and then the name of the file that was the function that was, or the program that's in the background, and then it prints the prompt right there. Okay, so we should be able to run our annoying program as well. And oh no, I forgot. I forgot to. We should be able to write annoying. I forgot to put it in the background. Annoying.sh in the background. There we go. And then now we're on our simple shell like that. Now, there happens to be no way to kill this. Well, 
That's not true. I could probably type job, I probably could type ps, and it will tell me that. And if I do a command called kill, it may work, although I don't see annoyed there, there yet, so maybe not. Anyway, how are we going to do it? We're going to type control C or quit. <laughs> And that's that. But anyway, the point is that now we've actually got a little bit more functionality to our simple shell, which, base, which is to say that we can now run a command in the background or what we call in the foreground, which actually pauses the parent. Anna. Yeah, good question. So the question was, hey, why are we waiting on the... Uh, PID in the parent. Okay, remember what the parent is doing. The parent is giving you back a prompt and waiting for you to type something, right? If I run a program normally without being in the background in what we call the foreground, we don't want the parent to put the prompt until it's waiting, waited for the child to end. Does that make sense? So that's what's happening here. It's waiting for the child to end when it's in the foreground because the child process is taking over the input output. Okay? If it's in the background, we don't want to wait PID because we want to go, oh, okay, it's off running on its own. Let's give you back a prompt so you can do more other things. Sense? Yeah. Wait, so does the child not finish until after the, like the argument or the commanding path that that, that can be the ends? Or? That's a good question. The question was, wait, does the child not finish until the exec CVP ends? Yes, the exec CVP is the child at that point. Remember, the entire process gets taken over by that program, and it is the child process. So even though you run that other program, that's the child process. When that program ends, then your wait PID will stop. Good question. Yeah. Will the child ever get to the line that your cursor's on right now? The child will never get here if the command was a legitimate command. Why? Because exec CVP never returns if it uh, cannibalizes the process and works correctly. Good question. Any other questions on that? OK. Let us, and you can go, and like I said, you can either run it in here or you can run it certainly on your uh, own computer uh, using the uh, myth machines. All right. Let's talk about another system call called pipe. All right. The pipe system call enables you to have two file descriptors, one of which you read from. The other you write to, and whenever you write something to that other one, you can read that data from the first one. Basically sets up two file descriptors that communicate with each other. Okay? Well, let's see how that actually works. It takes an, a little array, in fact a very small array, of two integers of FDS 0 and 1. Okay? So it takes a two integer array, and those integers, when you call pipe, Okay, they, uh, they, it populates th that array with two file descriptors. Okay, one of the file descriptors you're going to read from, the other one you're going to write to. Okay, and what it does is it actually, uh, it actually uh, sets it up so that parents and children can talk to each other because remember when you do fork, everything is copied. And the pointers into the open file table are also copied. So you get the same data, you get the data so that you can write to one and read from the other, and they're both in both the parent and the child. Okay, we're gonna see an example of this in a few minutes, uh, and you can do that. So, and you can see why it actually becomes important. Okay, but that's what pipe does. You call pipe, you pass in this tiny array, you do not have to initialize the array, it doesn't matter. You just pass it in, and it populates the, that array with two file descriptors, one of which writes, and the other one reads from the one that was just written. Okay, that's how it works. All right, let's look, at a, let's look at a program. In fact, I'll write this one out so we can do it one line at a time. Okay, um, this one is going to be called pipe experiment.c. Okay. So in here, what we're going to do, okay, is we are going to uh, do this int fds2. That's our file descriptor that the pipe is going to populate. Okay. And then we are going to say pipe fds. We're going to ignore the return value for now. Don't worry about the return value. Um, it actually is not. I, I think it may give us negative one uh, if it doesn't work. Just ignore it for now. Okay. And then we are going to uh, do a fork. P I D T P I D equals fork. Okay. All right. If P I D equals zero, which means we're the child. Okay. What are we going to do? We are going to, well, 
Here's what this program is going to do. I guess I should tell you that first. The program is going to create a pipe and the parent is going to write some data that the child will read. Okay, so the parent's going to write, the child is going to read. All right, by the way, this uh, file descriptor, everybody always gets confused. Which one's the read, which one's the write? The FDS0 is the reader, and I always remember that because you learn to read before you learn to write, so it's the first one is the reader, and so the second one, uh, FDS1, is the writer. That's the way I remember it. And what you can do is you can say, okay, um, because the child will read from the uh, pipe, okay, what we can do is we can immediately close the FDS1 no need to write. In other words, we're going to close the pipe. When you create a pipe, it creates two file descriptors, right? And when you fork, now you've got a total of four file descriptors because everything's copied. And by the way, it updates the reference counts too. So now you've got a situation where you've got like four file descriptors floating around out there. You only really want to use two of them. The reader will be in the child and the writer will be in the parent. You could use both, but if you try to, if both the parent and the child tried to write to the writer, they might get garbled up because it might not, there's no like real easy way of determining who's going to be writing at one particular time. You could probably figure that out, but that's not what we're trying to do here. We're simply trying to get the child to read from this pipe when the parent writes to it. So we're going to close FDS1 because the child does not need to uh, write. Okay, we're going to do a buffer that happens to have uh, six characters. We're going to only pass six characters in here. Okay, we're going to, the ch in the child, read from FDS0, and we're going to read into the buffer, and we're going to read into, we're going to read six characters, which is basically the size of the buffer. Okay, and then we're going to print read from pipe bridging the processes, okay, percent %s, whatever we, whatever we read, and we're going to write the buffer. All right. So that's that. Now we are done reading in our child, so we need to close FDS0 because we just, we just finished it. Okay, I'll just put, you know, done reading. Okay. And then we're going to return zero, or we could exit as well. So that's what the child is doing. Okay. The child is got this, these two pipe parts. It's going to close one of them because it's not going to bother writing to it. And then it's going to read from the other one. And then when it's done, it's going to close that. You should always close your file descriptors when you're done with them, except for standard in, standard out, and standard error. You don't need to close those. Okay. All right. So that's what the child is going to do. Okay. The parent, okay, the parent will write to FDS1, okay, so what's the one that we're going to actually close? FDS0, right? No reading necessary. All right, so that's what we're going to do there. And we know we're in the parent because it's the, not the uh, PID of 0 that we got back. Okay, uh, what we are going to do here is we are going to write FDS1, because that's the uh, writer part of the pipe, and we're going to write just hello. Okay, and we're going to write six bytes. Uh, why is it six bytes and not five? Because of the little null on the end there. Got to write that in there. Okay, and we are going to then just wait for the child. PID, PID. Uh, no, we could do this with the, with the uh, return values and all that, but we're not going to worry about it. And then we are done with writing. Done writing. So we close that pipe, and then we return 0. Okay, oops, got an extra one in there. All right, questions on that? Yeah? Um, do we have any guarantee that the parent is going to write before the child reads? You do not have any guarantee. That's a good question. The question was, do you have a guarantee the parent will write before the child reads? No. But remember, read blocks until it gets the number, of, uh, the number of bytes that you request. So unless the parent closes, that will wait until all six uh, bytes get in there. Generally, you actually, uh, yeah, well, it will wait if there are six available. If there were four and it closed, then it would only read four. But in this case, we know we're sending six. But no, that's a very good question a good point. Okay. All right, let's try to run this. Make pipe experiment. 
All right, pipe experiment. This is going to be kind of anticlimactic, but red from pipe bridging process. Hello. <laughs> okay, so that's all it did. Um, what questions do you have about this at this point? What other questions? Yeah. Tell me. If you made the buffer 12 long uh, and then but it would only, but you only wrote six. Let's try it and see what happens. All right, let's just try and see what happens. Okay. If we made the buffer 12 and said, hey, let's read 12. Okay. Uh, let's see, that was that. Size of the buffer is okay. And there we go. Let's see. Make pipe experiment. Pipe experiment. Same thing. So what happened was it tried to read 12 bytes. It read only six, and then the file ended. Like, in other words, the input file ended, and so it was able to continue. Now, what if we did this, though? What if we said, oh, I'm going to forget to close my writer. Let's see if this actually changes. This may or may not. It may close it when it, return, when it actually ends. Let's just see. Pipe experiment. And let's see. Yeah, OK, so it did actually, in that case, close it. But I bet if we ran it in Valgrind, oh, I don't know how to the actual file name. In Valgrind, you can check to see if the files are still open, and it will tell you. Not a good idea to leave them open just for waste. Yeah. All right, what other questions? Yeah. Can you only read and write to uh, one at a time? And if you had multiple children, would you be able to only use this once? You can use this pipe for whatever you want. As long as your logic is OK, you could have all your children reading from it. But you'd need to know what order things were happening back in the parent and so forth. Um, but generally, if you're trying to write to multiple children, you will probably create a different pipe for each child and just keep them in an array. And each child has its own uh, reader pipe that it's trying to read from. And by the way, the, we could have swapped this and had the child write to the pipe and the parent read it as well. But it, uh, that would work too. Oh, oh, good question. Why is it implemented as an array of two uh, file descriptors? This is the way they wrote it. I mean, it has to be, they just said, nope, you've got to have an array. And it, do, and it does have to be an array. It can't be like two. It's, it's not two parameters. It's one parameter, which is a pointer to an int array. And it can't be more than two. And it can't be more than two. A pipe is only working on two, creates a reader and a writer. That's it. Yeah, good question. So why do we wait for the child process before closing the file descriptor? Uh, it, it could be that if you close, it probably could be, and I, I'm not 100% sure on this, but it probably could be that if you close the file descriptor before the reader has done reading, it might actually say, oh, both, both the writer's done, I'm not going to actually produce any more information. So you kind of want to wait. You definitely don't want to close it until you're sure that the other uh, process has done all the reading. I think that's it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions on this one? Yeah. yeah. At fork, we, I didn't say four processes, or if I did, I, I apologize. We have four file descriptors now, because we have two file descriptors for FDS in the parent and two file descriptors for FDS in the child. Only two processes. Whenever you fork, you get one more process. Two processes, but you've got a copy of FDS. So the parent has FDS 0 and 1, and the child has FDS 0 and 1, which is why we had four closes in here. right? We closed FDS 1, and the child immediately, because we're not we, uh, writing to it. We close it after we're done reading because we're done with it completely. And then the exact opposite in the parent. Yep. So, but how can, I thought since they're copies, they don't like update in each other's like, frame. Good question. The question is wait, wait, are they not, are, if they're copies, they don't update in each frame. When you fork, right, they each end up getting, they, they, they both end up pointing to the open file table, which is one file that's open, right, for, for the actual file descriptors. And it does update the reference counts for who's pointing to them. So it does it does it does not make new does no, no more opens in that case, right? Yeah. So how is the child process know when the writing is finished? Good question. The, the the question was how does the child process know when the writing is finished? Uh, it reads as many bytes as are available. 
is really what it is. So I asked it to read six bytes, so it will read six bytes if they're available. That's how it knows. It waits until they're all ready, they're all available. No, 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 no. It's possible for the child to try to read before the write is done, but it waits until those six are available. So they're not available. They might not be available when you, that read command is generated. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Um, so by waiting, do you mean like there's a signal in like the read function and while it's in the child process, then it'll wait until it receives that signal and then execute the rest of that child process after read? Like once it actually has. So what you're asking about, the question was basically, wait, how does this waiting work here? Read is a system command, or a system call, okay? And the kernel says, oh, okay, you want to read six bytes from this other file, or from this file descriptor. Are they available yet? Nope, no, no data has been read yet. Oh, okay, I'll just put you to sleep until they're available, and then when, when they're available, I'll give you them back, you will read them all, and then you will continue along with your program. Yeah, that's actually very, that's a very good question because later on you'll, we'll see a function where we go, wait a minute, how does, we're going to use a sort function, how does the sort function know to wait for the data? It just says, hey, give me all the data until the file ends. And if there's no, if there's no data, if the file hasn't ended, it'll just wait until data comes in. So we'll get to a little bit more of that later. Yeah. Yeah, let's try this. It may actually, it probably, Ah, yeah, if we don't close the thing, that's the good question. The question was, wait, what if we changed it to we only wrote uh, high and we only wrote three bytes instead of uh, six? Let's see, make pipe experiment, pipe, pipe experiment. Uh, let's see, in that case, it looks like it, uh, let's see, did we change anything else? We still, oh, we didn't, cl um, let's see. Yeah, in that case, it may have been because we actually, the parent ended and the file closed on its own. That's probably what happened. So in other words, the file, so if we were to do something like this, let's do this. Uh, let's do this, uh, while on semicolon, just keep going forever, right? Like the parent won't end. Uh, we won't be able to tell if the child ends. Ah, yes we will. You guys are making me do all this crazy stuff. How about this? Uh, it probably won't actually, won't actually, shouldn't actually print anything, but let's just do the printf, child is ending like that, make pipe experiment, pipe experiment there. Okay, so it did seem to do, it did seem to read the bytes probably, possibly because the zero is on the end of the high. That might be what it is. Um, I don't know, we can check again. There's some nuances in here that, uh, let's see, that one's still, the parent is still three. What if we made it only two? Hang on, if we made it six, it would read past the end of the buffer. That's probably not what we want to do. But, I mean, that would just be like, let's see. There we go, now we've only written two. So I think it, what happens is these file descriptors are what we call somewhat buffered. If it gets a zero, it will pass it on to the and uh, to the other program, prob possibly. This is probably what's going on there, is what's happening. Where's the what? Oh, hi, at. It, because I didn't pass the actual zero on there. Uh, so, oh, you know what? That's the other thing. Yeah, so it did get a zero eventually. So it tried to pass, it tried to read. It must have read only two or whatever, and then there is no zero on the end. So that's actually another thing. So yeah, so yeah, it's a little more nuanced than that. Yeah. So what this tells you is that you do have to be you do have to make sure your logic is correct so that you know how much data is being re read and written. It's not as important as you think because normally we will actually close files when we're done writing to them. So you should just remember to do that. It may or may not work depending on what you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. What did this experiment reveal? This didn't reveal anything as it turns out. Good question. Yeah, I thought it was gonna. I thought it was gonna maybe pause and say no, I didn't get enough data, but it only wrote two, and then the it closed anyway, and or it didn't actually uh, wait for more data, as it turns out. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's a way to do that. Let's see. I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly. I'm not sure exactly how we would get it to pause in the child. I I mean maybe when it gets to this wait PID, it says 
it does something with it. But I, I'll have to look it up. I'll try to find out if this actually, if we can, if I can, if we can fool it into pausing in the child to wait for more data. There may be some timeout as well in the read. Yeah. What if you never wrote any data and it was just waiting to read? Like there was no, no. Data yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we can try it and see if there's no data we're actually writing at all. Make pipe experiment. Whoops. Okay, pipe experiment. Yeah. If we write no data, it goes, ah, I'm waiting for some data. And there's probably either a timeout in there or when the read write function finishes its write, it tells the read, go ahead and read anything and so forth. So yeah. So this one told us nothing. <laughs> it said if we don't write anything, we will get, you know, we'll get a paw, uh, we'll stop in the child. Yeah. And wait for more, more data. Okay. Lots of nuance, I suppose, in this. All right. But anyway, that's how pipe works. Pipe creates two file descriptors, one you can write to, one you can read from, from and whatever you wrote to the, the one you can write to gets read from the other one. Okay? This actually makes things very interesting uh, as we go along. Okay? In fact, why don't I show you something first before we get to the next little part here. Um, there is a program built into Unix called sort. And what sort does is it will sort input that you type in line by line. It will sort it uh, doing that. So if I type uh, bat and cat and apple and dinosaur and uh, let's do some other things in here. Um, bling and cool and whatever. And when I end, right, if I do control D, it will actually rewrite all the output in sorted order. That's what sort does. Okay. If I had a file let's say uh, uh, unsorted.txt, and I put these words in the unsorted file, I could do the following thing. I could say sort unsorted.txt. I could also do cat unsorted.txt and then pipe it into sort. Okay? And what that does is sort member takes input as you're typing it waits until it's all in, sorts all the lines, and then spits them all out again. Okay, but this pipe idea, this little, this little uh, vertical bar, is, says take the output from cat, which is the words, and send it into the input of sort. Okay, so you gotta think about what's going on there. There's actually the output of one file becomes the input of another file, and we do that with a pipe. Okay, so that's actually what we're about to take a look at now. Okay, all right, so let's see how we're going to, this is the one we could run that again, we already did that. Okay, um, we've already talked about all this, all these things about uh, how the actual pipe works. Okay, um, I think that's a duplicate. Okay, here's an example that we're going to do, and you will redo this function and make it more robust for your next assignment, assignment three, which is going to come out on Thursday. Uh, and it is um, a process or a function we're going to create called subprocess. Okay? And subprocess uses all of these kind of uh, these pipe and fork and dupe and a thing called dupe two, which we'll get to what that means uh, in a minute. And it uses execcvp and so forth to produce to basically say, I want to send my output of my program to some other file that's running. Okay, so it's kind of neat. The thing we need to uh, first look at is this struct that we are going to create. It is called subprocess underscore t, and here's what it has in it. It has a PID, which is the process of the, uh, the I guess it's the program you're running, process of the program you're running, and it has a supply file descriptor. In other words, a file descriptor that if you write to it, it becomes the input to the file that you, the program you're running. Okay, yeah, I'll say that again. It gives you the process identifier for the program you're running, and it also gives you a file descriptor that when you write to it, it becomes the input for the file you're running. So let's think about how we're going to use this for sort, and that's actually the example we are going to use exactly. One sec, Cosmo. What we're going to do is we are going to create a subprocess of the sort program, and then we're going to pass into it a bunch of a bunch of strings, and the sort program is going to sort them and print the output to the screen. Our program is going to pass in a bunch of strings to sort, 
and we're going to let sort do the sorting. That's what's going on. You'll see how it works in a minute. I'm getting some faces like, I don't get it. You'll see when it, when it happens. Haas, maybe the question. Um, is it the PID of the new program that you're going to have to input to, or is it the PID of the program that was originally It's the PID of the child process, which is the one of, in this case, the sort, for instance. And you'll see why we need to, why we need to do that, um, because we need to wait for it. Okay, we're going to create the subprocess and then wait for it to end after we've sent it all the data. You'll see how it works in a minute. Okay. All right. So uh, we are going to again pass in a command, which is going to, in our case, be sort or whatever fun whatever file or program we want to run, and it's going to uh, create that process, start that process running, and it's going to basically tell the process, "Hey, I'm going to give you a bunch of standard in as if I as if you were typing it." And then your job is to do whatever you want with it. In this case, it's going to sort. In our case, it's going to sort it. OK? That's what's going on. All right. So let's actually look at it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, type in. I'm going to start with main, actually. Subprocess.c. I'm going to start with main here. OK, here's the type. Here's the struct that we're going to have. Okay. And in main, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make this program sort a bunch of words for us that we're going to pass to the sorting program. Okay. So we're going to start out and we're going to say, okay, we haven't written this function yet. We will. Subprocess t s p equals subprocess. And the sort program lives at slash user slash bin slash sort. Okay. Our subprocess is going to take that sort function. It's going to create this subprocess t struct for us. It's going to create all the little pipe, the pipe that's necessary, and it's going to set it all up. We'll get to that. Okay, but that's what it's going to do. It's going to start the sort program going, waiting for our data. Okay. All right. So then we're going to cre let's create some words, char star words, uh, and this in this case is going to I don't know. We'll use some words like let's use uh, Jerry calls them. Uh, SAT words like fe felicity, umbrage, doesn't matter, whatever word you want, susurration, hopefully I'm spelling these right, halcyon, etc. Okay, we're just basically creating a bunch of words uh, that we're going to pass into this sort because we want to do that. Pulchritude, uh, let's see, ablution, uh, Som not somnolent. How do you find how to pronounce that one? Okay, and then how about indefatigable? Okay, doesn't matter if I didn't spell them right. That's the way. Okay, so anyway, we're going to create a bunch of words. They are not sorted right now. Okay, they're in just kind of random order. Okay, and then we are going to take those words i equals zero. I is less than size of the words divided by size of words zero. That should be familiar from 107, what we're doing there. And then I plus plus. Okay. And then we're going to use a new function call called dprintf. Okay. dprintf says, hey, print to a particular file descriptor. Okay. Well, we have a file descriptor because we created the subprocess up here, so sp. We're going to go right to the supply FD, and we're going to write out each one of these strings separated by the new line. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, "Hey, I'm going to take this file descriptor I got back from subprocess, and I'm going to throw a bunch of words, a bunch of words at it, followed by new lines, just as if I were typing those words in to the sort function." Okay, all right. And then after we're done with that, we're done, uh, we're done with the uh, closing of, or we're done writing the word, so we should close our thing. We'll, we'll have to test this and see if we don't close that, if it, uh, if it stops the sort, if sort actually stops. I doubt it will, but it may, I don't know. And then we could actually, uh, actually in this case, yeah, well, we might as well. Uh, PID T, PID equals weight, PID for the PID that we were given in the subprocess. Okay, status and zero. And then uh, we are going to, let's see, uh, return P 
PID equal, we're going to basically check and see if we got an actual good return value. If uh, we got the correct PID back from wait PID, then we have to check W if exited. And if that is, uh, if we exited properly, we better return the st exit status from the file we created. Or we, let's just return negative 127, which basically means not good. We didn't return anything reasonable. Okay. All right. Let's see. So, oh, this, this should actually almost work, except we didn't create the subprocess function yet. Make subprocess. Okay, good. So it worked. We have no now create the subprocess. Does everybody get what's going on here? Creating a subprocess that's about to take in all these words we're going to send into it. We're going to deprintf to that file descriptor that we know that subprocess is listening on. And then we are going to uh, wait for that process to do all the sorting. When it does, we're going to end our program. That's what mains do. Okay. All right. So the subprocess function itself. Okay. Well, we're going to use our pipe in this case. Okay. FDS two. We're going to create that. Okay. And then we're going to create a pipe. Pipe. FDS like that. Okay. All right. And then uh, we are going to. Create a little sub process, T process. We'll call it process in this case. Okay. This is a struct, remember, so we can use the little curly braces to do this. This is, seems a little weird, but I'm basically going to call fork and then I'm going to pass in, I'm going to make the uh, FDS1, which is the writer, which we're going to uh, send back to the calling function. This is what's going to get returned from this function. Okay, we've got the PID, and then we're going to also populate it with the writing part so that we can write from our original calling function. Okay. All right, so that's what we're going to do there. If process.pid, which we just created, equals zero, well, we're in the child. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to actually do some setup so that we can read from the file descriptor as standard in. Well, what does that mean? Okay, well, no writing necessary from the child, right? So let's do that close business before, FDS1. No writing necessary. Okay, and then we're going to use this function called dupe2. Okay, dupe2, and I'm going to, I'll write the whole thing out what we're going to do here. We're going to take that read, or that, uh, yeah, that reader that we get back from the pipe, and we're basically going to copy it such that standard in whenever we read from standard in in the child it is actually going to read from that pipe that's what this is doing okay it's creating a copy of this uh, FDS 0 descriptor and setting it such that FDS or, or the standard in file number which is basically which is generally 0 is now going to point to our new pipe so it's basically saying, nope, no more typing. We're going to get our input from this file descriptor. That's what the dupe2 is doing. Okay. Once we do that, because we've duplicated it, we can actually close FDS1 or 0 because we're done with it. Already duplicated. Okay. And basically, this is, again, this is now we've already said, hey, standard in is going to come from this pipe. So we can close the original because we've done made the copy that we need. Okay, and then we're just going to do a little bit of um, a little bit of setup to actually call our command here, which is another like slash bin slash sh with the dash c argument, which says run the program I'm about to I'm about to pass you in, and then uh, it is going to we need to do a little casting because it's constant command. And then we need to make it null on the end there like that. And that's basically creating the command line that we're about to uh, do use exec VP on, or exec CVP on. And then we're going to CVP, exec CVP, argv0, argv, and that's that. Okay. If, and that's it for the child. Okay. The child is going to never return. Child will never get to here. Sad face. Okay. All right. And then, or maybe it's happy face. So that's actually what we want. In the 
uh, parent, we are not going to use not used in parent. We've also got to close FDS0 there because there's no reading that's happening in the parent. We're just letting sort print out to the, to the terminal. And then we have to return the process. Okay, So that's what's happening with this function. It's basically doing what? Creating a pipe. So we've got two file descriptors. Uh, setting up this subprocess t struct with the PID of the child and then FDS1 uh, for the parent. This is for the, uh, the, one, the only one we care about is the parent. And the child, if it's the child, we have to do some more setting up. We close FDS1 because we're not actually uh, writing to it. We are going to duplicate FDS0 so that we're able into, file sta or into standard in so that we can read from standard in from that file as standard in. Then we're going to close that because we duplicated it. Then we're going to set up the uh, command to actually use execvp, and then we're going to do execvp. And if we're the parent, we are returning, closing the, uh, the reader and returning the parent. Okay. Question? How would you close the one that you duplicated in do2? How would you close the one you duplicated in do2? Well, we closed the one there that we actually did there. You mean the other one? The, that will get closed by the function we, or the program we call when it just closes all of its open. Or it will just, when a program ends, standard in gets closed automatically. That's what would happen there. Okay. All right, let's actually try it. Make subprocess. We'll see if I have any. Nope. Okay. So subprocess, we passed in all those words. Okay. And subprocess should sort them. And it did. Okay. So subprocess used sort to actually do the sorting for the words that we passed in. Okay, it was exactly as if I had had these words, oh, they're gonna be sorted now, hang on. Then unsorted.txt, let's do this. There's probably a, there's probably a uh, command in vim to actually, screw, I'll actually scramble up your words, but. OK, so there we go. Those are not sorted. OK, it would be exactly the same as doing this. Cat unsorted pipe into sort. And there it does. It does the actual sorting for us. OK. All right. So now that you've seen it work and you've actually, oops, you've actually done that, what other questions do you have about it? Yeah. Ah, that's such a good question. The question was, hey, what, does execcvp discard the old file descriptors? No, right? File descriptors are actually passed on to the child, or passed on to the program exactly as they are. And that's a good question about why they chose to do that. Probably for this exact reason is why they do that. But anything that's process related, you kind of want to keep it with the process. You don't want to destroy file descriptors and things uh, because the uh, the other file, the new program might use it. That's, old memory yeah. All the old memory, right. I, I couldn't, in the other program, I wouldn't have no access to FDS0 and FDS1. They don't exist in the, that program. But the file descriptors are still open in that program. Yeah, good, very good question. What other questions do you have on this one? Everybody gets how, how it's working? All right. And you get why we might want to do this and how it's actually doing the piping. OK. All right. OK, so we've got this. We've got the SAT words. Um, here's an important part. The close call, and that was, we'll have to check that. I promise we'd check that. When you do the close in the actual parent, that's what tells sort to start sorting, because it doesn't get any more data. It's just if I control, control D in the words that I type. So let's actually try it. It may, uh, depending on how it's written, it may actually do this. But what if we forgot to close this after we did it? Make subprocess, and then subprocess. There we go. It's waiting. So sort is over there going, hey, I haven't seen the end of the file yet. I'm just going to wait for you to end the, to, for the file to end. So in this case, we've crashed while well, we've paused sort. We've frozen it because it's still waiting for our data. And since we can't wait for the data anymore, or since there's no more data coming, it will just it will not actually end. So that's, so that's another good reason for um, remembering to close your file descriptors. Yeah. 
Good question. Why is it this close that prevents the, and this is, a good, this is a good question. What is this close actually doing? Well, remember, we're now in the parent. Okay, we've set the subprocess, the sort program going. What's the sort program doing? Waiting for us to type in tech. It's waiting for us to type things in, right? So at this point down here, this is as if we are typing in a bunch of words. Okay, they go to our or the supply FD that we've created with the pipe earlier. They are being read by standard in in sort, which now has been duped so that it's standard in is the output part of the, the reader for the supply or the pipe. And it's waiting, sort waits until you, the file ends before it does the sorting. And it has to, right? I mean, sort can't, you can't sort, I mean, you can start to sort as you go, but you can't officially print anything out until you get the last word, because what if it was the first word in the list? You couldn't have already printed something. So it needs to wait until no more words are incoming. Well, in this case, the only way it knows no more words are incoming is when that file ends, and it says, oh, okay, no more words are incoming. Then it can continue. That's why it's that close. Very good question. Very well, yeah. dprintf prints to a file descriptor. Whatever file descriptor we give it, printf just normally prints to the terminal. dprintf is new and it goes, oh, look, this, there's, a, there's a parameter right here, which is our file descriptor. Okay? That file descriptor is what dprintf prints to. So, and, so in this case, we're going to print to the supply file descriptor, which is the writer end of the pipe. The reader end has now been turned into standard in for sort. Write to this end, read from this end into sort. Make sense? Now, did you have a follow up or more question? No. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly what you're exactly what it was. Good. All right. Anybody else on this one? More questions on this? Okay, good. All right. You will get lots of practice with this for the next assignment. Okay? All right. Um, oh, we've already done this. Uh, da da da, sub process. Okay. So we have about uh, 15 minutes to go. Let me introduce you to another topic. We may not actually write any code for this right now. When you have two processes that you want to communicate, when you want to communicate between the two, okay, one way to do it is by reading and writing actual data. But that's not necessarily really what you want to do. You just want to basically tell another process, hey, I'm, I'm done with something, or something has happened in my process that you might be waiting for, or hey, go do this thing because it's time. I'm done with my stuff. It's your turn to go take that and run with it. Okay? We do this with the idea of signals. And a signal is just a message. In fact, you can't even really pass data along with it, as it turns out. It basically just says, hey, this following thing, you can pass one number. <laughs> it says what kind of a signal it is, basically. Um, it's a small message that allows you to say some event has occurred. Okay? Signals get sent by the kernel all the time. Every time you con hit Control C in your program, you have sent a signal to the program that basically kills it. That's what that's a signal. There's a signal called um, sig kill, all right, which kills it. Or and, and there's lots of other signals we'll we'll talk about as we go along. How do these signals get handled? Like in other words, what function does the processing once a signal comes in? Well, you have a special function called a signal handler, and a signal signal handler is a function that actually gets called only when some event happens. So the kernel is waiting around for some event to happen. It realizes there's a signal that needs to get sent, and it tells that function in your program to do this. If you took CS107E, you've dealt with signal handlers a lot when you did uh, interrupts and so forth. You created a function that when you typed a keyboard press, let's say, that function got called. Okay? It's called event handling, and now we're able to do this in C. Okay, um, there's a uh, sig seg or sig s e g v, which happens when you get a seg fault, right? Whenever you dereference null, you get a signal sent to your program that says, ah, you seg faulted, and it generally kills your program. You could capture that and deal with it and not have your program killed. Some programs do that, but uh, that's one thing we can do. And this is what signal handlers allow you to do. They allow you to take those signals and do something with them. 
There are some signals you can't, uh, you can't actually capture. Uh, one is sig kill, you're not allowed to like say, hey, you can't kill my process. And the other one is um, a stop, which we'll talk about later as we go along too. Okay, so basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, here's a process, when something happens, some event happens, call this other function. No matter where it is in our code, by the way, some other external thing calls our function, our program stops everything, goes to that function and starts dealing with the signal that came in, which is a little weird to deal with um, when, you, uh, when you get into it. We'll, we'll do lots of details on this. Okay, what other kinds of details or signals are there? There's uh, sig uh, floating point exception, which is basically when you do things like divide by zero, you get this weird exception, this weird signal that says, whoa, you did some math wrong and that's bad. Okay, I can't deal with that, so I'm going to send a signal. Uh, I told you we got sig int, which is the uh, interrupt. I think I call it sig kill. It's called sig int, and that's the um, uh, terminates your program. There is uh, sig stop. Remember I did control Z earlier? That actually stops your program and just pauses it for a while, okay, and brings you back to the terminal if you're in the terminal, okay? And then you can have a sig continue or sig c-o-n-t, which continues the process running. We will see some really neat examples of when those two signals are um, used. You can actually send signals to yourself, by the way. You can tell your own program, stop, <laughs> Don't, just wait, is what you can tell your program to do. It basically says, wait for somebody else to continue you. And we'll see that uh, in uh, some interesting examples um, of that. Okay, uh, when pipes end, you get a sig pipe. When, uh, when children end, you get a sig chld for ch it's a child ending. And that's an interesting one that we'll use, as you can imagine. Okay, this is the one we're talking about right now. Sig child is what happens whenever the child changes state. So in other words, your child process is going along doing something. If it stops, a sig child message is sent to the parent saying, hey, your child just stopped. Do you care about that? <laughs> maybe you do, maybe you don't. A sig child happens when the child ends. So the, child, the, the, function handle, or the signal handler gets called. And it also gets called when it continues as well. Okay? The parent process should actually use wait PID to handle when a child state changes. Okay, we've done that already. We've kind of ignored it in a couple cases, by the way. If you go back and look at the uh, simple SH, you'll see that when you have a, f a background process, we actually ignore the wait PID and we never do it. It's actually not the best way to do it. You should, we should have handled it at some point, even though we didn't. Okay, but we'll get to this. You can get a SIG child sent to a particular function in your program. That's when you end up calling wait PID. Okay, you don't actually normally do it in the main loop in the program. Sometimes you do, but normally you don't. You actually wait until the child handler function is called. Most of the time, we ignore all the function, all the signals. Most of them we ignore. We can't ignore kill, we can't ignore sig int, and we can't ignore stop. But we can ignore all the other ones, and normally you do. So far in C and C++, you've never handled a signal before unless you're in uh, 107E. But in CS107 or CS106B, you just ignored them. These signals were happening and whatever, and you were just ignoring them, or they were killing your program. Okay? So that's what's happening in, uh, in there. We will write some functions that actually do this. Okay? And the purpose of a sig child handler is almost always do wait PID and maybe handle some other things. Okay? All right, so here's some code. Uh, we'll just take a, a real quick look at this program. Okay? Um, this program is a little Disneyland example, actually. Jerry wrote it. And it is, uh, what it's doing is, it is basically setting up a bunch of forks. And it's modeling, okay, the parent takes a bunch of his children to Disneyland and uh, sends them off and they all go play. And then when the, and the dad goes to sleep, while the parent, while the children are out playing, and then one by one they come back. Dad wakes up and he says, "Oh, I'm glad you're back." When all the children are back, they leave the park. That's what this is modeling. Okay, and here's what it actually looks like. Okay, it's pretty simple. You've got uh, a printf that says, "Let my five children play while I take a nap." Okay, and then it sets up a signal to a function that we are about to see. Function is not here yet. It's going to set up a signal, a sig child signal 
to that function called reap child, as it turns out. That's the name of the function we'll write. Okay? Then it's going to do a for loop for the number of kids, five kids in this case, uh, and then if it's the child process, it is going to make the child uh, go to sleep, basically, for three seconds based on the number of the child. Okay, so the first child is going to come back immediately. The second child is going to sleep for three seconds. And so, actually, no, that's not true. The first child is going to sleep for three seconds because it's one that it's going to. The first child is going to sleep for three seconds. The next child is going to sleep for six, etc. Okay, and then uh, it's going to, when the child wakes up, pretend they're off playing, it's going to close that child, finish that child. At that point, this signal handler will get called. Okay, and then that is about it. Okay, actually, there's there's a little bit more to it in terms of like what happens in the parent. Um, at, in the parent, you actually have to wait for them while the number of children done is less than the total number of children you have, which is five in this case. Okay, printf at least one child is still playing, so dad sleeps, nods off, and the dad is going to sleep for five seconds. Okay, and then after the dad, when the dad wakes up, when the child handler happens, the dad will actually wake up. Sleep is an interesting command. When you get any signal, sleep actually stops. So you think it's doing it for five seconds, but it's actually going to do it until some signal handles uh, happens. Okay, and down here we have the tiny little function called reap child, which basically waits for the child that just ended using negative one because we don't know which one ended. We just know that some child just ended. And then it increments the number of done. Num done, because it's in a different function than main, we actually have to use a global variable. Hmm. It's kind of too bad, because we don't necessarily like global variables. But this is a case where oh, you kind of have to use a global variable, because there's no other real way to pass information um, between uh, two functions. Okay. One other thing. The reap child function is in the parent. So the parent's process gets called when the child has a ch change of state. Okay. So let me actually let me actually uh, quickly type this in and run it. Uh, let's see, this one's called five children. Actually, let's do this. Copy five children to five children. C. Yes. Okay. Make five children. Five children, here's what it does. At least one child is playing, so dad nods off. The first child comes back after three seconds, returns to dad. The first child is after six seconds, returns to dad. The third child is after nine seconds, returns to dad. Uh, the fourth child uh, returns to dad after uh, the next second. The fifth child returns to dad after uh, the last time. So actually, I guess in this case, the sleep didn't actually stop. So it did. This, the parent one didn't. I gotta look that up. I thought it happened. I guess it's only when it's. Um, I'll have to look this up. I thought it stopped, but it didn't in this case. Basically, that's what happens in the uh, thing. Okay, every child comes back after three seconds. After three seconds. After three seconds, the reap child function gets called when the child finishes. Okay, let's look at the code again, and for the last two minutes or, or four minutes, we will talk about whatever questions you have about it. What questions? you have about this code at this point? Like what's happening here? Maybe that you're just tired and haven't understood. Yes, question. Why is there a parameter for reap child? Why is there a parameter for reap child? Oh, good question. Um, that is, I believe, the signal that, had, that was uh, triggered. So in other words, it's going to be sig child as it turns out. That's a good question. The question was, what, why is this parameter here? We're not using it here because we don't care. We know there's only one signal that could get into this function. But yeah, if we had multiple, multiple signals that we sent to the same function, you might want to know that. Good question. Yes? So the, the only reason this is happening in order is just because we're waiting for such a long amount of time that like, it's likely that number one will finish before number two and number two will finish before. Yes, good question. The question was, wait, why is it happening in order? Remember how we set this up, right? We said that each child waits for three seconds times the number it is. So the first child waits for three, then six, then nine, right? So that's the, that's the only reason it's happening in that order. If they have, on Wednesday, we'll see an example where we're trying to do them all at the same time, and we'll see that this actually breaks, which is not really what we want. Hasna. Um, do you remember the output one more time? The output, yes. I'm kind of confused why when the dad wakes up, 
Yeah, this is the good question. Why does the dad wake up here? The dad is sleeping for five seconds. The first child comes back after three, and the dad's still got two more seconds of sleeping, right? But then the dad goes back to sleep for five, but in the meantime, second six happens and second nine happens, so that's two in a row before the dad wakes up again. I was thinking the dad would wake up every time the signal, but that's not true. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Can you explain why you're doing Yes, good question. The question is why are we doing a weight PID in the uh, REAP child? We do want to clean up after children, right? When a child ends, we should call weight PID to do the cleanup. That's the function that does the clean, tells the colonel, go clean up after this child, okay? So we might as well do it in REAP child because we gotta clean up for it sometime, might as well do it right then. Yeah, good question. Okay. If you didn't wait, would there be a memory leak? If you didn't wait, good question. If you didn't wait, would there be a memory leak? It wouldn't necessarily be a memory leak, but it's kind of like not it's kind of like a memory leak. I mean, I guess it's a memory leak in the sense that when your program ends, all the children get handled. And in the meantime, we're done with them. Why are they still available? That's kind of, so yeah, in some sense, it's a little bit of a memory leak. There's extra resources being used that, why, why use them? Yeah. Any other questions on this? Yeah. So, sorry, weight PID like cleans up the memory from the child as well? Weight, yes, good question. Weight PID does clean up the memory from the child and it, it returns any resources that the child might be using. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. So REAP child could have done anything? I mean, you could just tie that signal to any sort of process? REAP child, yeah, that's a good question. REAP child could have done anything. There are any signal, and there's less than 30, but a bunch of different signals. Any signal we could have this function handle. And remember, this function gets called no matter what. Dad happens to be sleeping. This function gets called and go and start running while when that when that happens. So there's two parts of your program now in the same process, which could be doing two things at the same time now. So it's another parallelism that we have to kind of de deal with. All right, last question and then we're gonna let you guys go. Yeah. You could have given yes, good question. When you type when you say signal sig child root child, whatever you type here that's what you end up getting. That's the signal that the reap child is going to look for or get caught triggered on. We're we're passing sig child because we know we're creating a bunch of children that we want to handle. That's why we're called. That's why we're having sig child. The sig child signal gets sent no matter what. In this case, we're letting it. We're making it call our function. That's that. Okay. If you have other questions, come on up. I will see you guys Wednesday. <laughs>